Thanks so much for coming. Happy Easter. Um, all over the world today, millions of people are celebrating the risen Savior. And uh, one of the ways that we celebrate as the church is I say he is risen and you say he is risen indeed. All right. So let's do that together. He is risen. All right, amen. It's so good to have you here this morning. Um, This is the one day that we take time out and celebrate um, with all of those Christians around the world, our risen Savior. We do that every Sunday, but particularly on this day, we recognize that. And it's also the one day that in unison, we can recognize together that... um, that peeps are the worst Easter candy ever invented. And they are satanic. (laughs) Uh, The other day, I was going through Walmart, and I saw this just terrifying sight, uh, which I know is surprising at the Corsican of Walmart, but just a terrifying sight. just put shivers down my spine. Look at what I saw at the Corsican of Walmart. This awful display. Oh, man, I was just so terrified. And then, I mean, look at the pink ones. Look, that's how you know they're demonic. Look at those. They just look like little demons just staring at you. It's the most wicked candy. Take it down. I, can, I can't even stand to look at it anymore. I'm sorry I ruined your Easter by showing you that. Um, no, we really are excited to, to celebrate the Lord today. And, and so... Um, We're just going to jump right in. We're going to look at John uh, chapter 20, verses 11 through 17. I want to read that to you, and we're going to talk about three Easter questions that we all must answer. So let's dive right in. This is right uh, after Jesus had been crucified and been buried, and then Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb, and this is what it says. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb And saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? crying? Who is it? that you are looking for. And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Three questions we see in this passage. The first is this, why are you crying? Jesus asks Mary, why are you crying? And um, it's, it's an interesting question because I think a better question is why wouldn't she have been crying? I mean, she had just been through a devastating time Her Lord, her Savior, her friend, her Redeemer, the one who freed her. Because you'll remember when Mary met Jesus for the first time, Jesus cast out seven demons from her. She was in the worst possible condition that she could have been in. When Jesus met her, she was broken, she was scared, she was oppressed, and she was possessed. And so, of course, she was crying because the one who had freed her, the one who had made her life new, the one who had transformed her and changed her was now the one that she was coming to pay her respects to. And instead of finding the tomb there closed with Jesus' body inside, she shows up and the stone has been rolled away and someone has taken the body. And in her mind, it was the ultimate sign of disrespect that someone would have come and would have done this to a dead body, especially the one who she loved. 
And so, of course, she was crying. And there were probably many other reasons why she was crying. I mean, maybe when she realized that Jesus was really gone, maybe she thought, am I going to fall right back into my old ways? Am I going to have to face my demons again? And maybe she was crying because not only had she witnessed Jesus die, but he didn't die an ordinary death. She witnessed him tortured. I mean, we all come here today because we want to pay honor to Jesus. And so many of you, most of you, I would venture, know the story. You know that, that Jesus was tortured. You know that he was beaten, that he was whipped, that his skin tore off like ribbons when he was whipped. You know that the nails were driven through his hands and his feet. You know that he was crucified on what is likely the cruelest torture instrument ever invented, the cross. And so, of course, Mary cried. But what does that mean for you and me? Well, I believe why are you crying is a question that we have to answer too because I believe that we all show up at a place like this on a day like this and we all have our own hurts. We all have our own tears. We all have our own struggles. And part of the Easter story is not just that we look at someone like Mary and say, why are you crying? But part of the Easter story is we look at ourselves and we have to examine our own hearts and see why are we crying? What hurts are we carrying with us into this room today? Maybe it's relational hurts. Maybe you're going through a relational breakup or difficulty in your marriage and you're crying today because your heart is broken. Maybe you're like Mary. Mary wasn't the only person who stood at a tomb crying. Maybe you stood at a cemetery crying at the loss of a loved one or a close friend or someone you really cared about. And maybe that's why today you come into this place and you're carrying your own sorrow. Maybe you're mourning the loss of a business and you're facing financial instability and insecurity. And maybe that's why you're here today crying. It could be a number of different things. Maybe just today you woke up and you don't even know why you're here and you don't have any purpose or meaning. There could be as many reasons as there are people here today as to why you may be crying. But I think it's a a question worth asking and answering for us because part of the Easter story is that we can't rejoice until we weep. That weeping comes first, and only then is there rejoicing. And all of us have to face this issue What is it that is nagging at our soul today? What is it that is hurting us today? Because you'll never find Jesus until you admit your pain, your tears, and your struggle. Why are you crying? The second question that we see in the passage is, who are you looking for? Mary sees the two angels. They say, why are you crying? And then she Through her tears, she sees this other person in the room, and she doesn't realize it's Jesus. She's probably crying so hard that she can't even see through the tears. And she wasn't expecting to see Jesus anyway. And so she's crying, and he says, why are you crying? And then he says, who are you looking for? And I think that's a key question, such an important question for us to ask as well. Who are you looking for? I mean, you may know your struggle and your pain already, and you may know, hey, this is why I'm crying, but what is it that you're looking for that will make things right in your life? What is it that you're looking for that will make things right with the world? For Mary, we knew who she was looking for. I'm looking for my Savior, but he's not here. And if you took his body, please tell me where you put him. Well, what are you looking for? And who are you looking for? It's an important question for all of us to wrestle with. We all are looking for something in this life. We all are looking for something to make sense of this world. We're all looking for something 
to sort of make it all click and connect the dots and put it all together so that we can make sense of the craziness that we see. Everybody's looking for the, for the newest, for the biggest, for the greatest next big thing. And many people are looking for it in the wrong places. Many people think that wealth and the accumulation of it is the one thing that will put it all together for them. Many people think that success and climbing the ladder is going to put it all together for them. Many people think that finding the right person is going to put it all together for them. And all of those people gain money and they gain success and they get the right person only to find out at a later date that everything that they were looking for couldn't possibly be found in that stuff or in that person. And they only leave empty and let down. Y'all remember the actor Shia LaBeouf? He played in the uh, first Transformers movie and in a bunch of other movies. And I read his story the other day. This is what he had to say about his life. He said, my life was on fire. I was walking out of hell. I didn't want to be an actor anymore, and my life was a mess, a complete mess, and I'd hurt a lot of people. I felt deep shame and deep guilt. I didn't like to go outside much. I had a yearning not to be here anymore. When all of my designs failed, when all of my plans went out the window, when my life had led to serious infliction of pain and damage on other people, I threw up my hands like my plans are garbage. I had a gun on the table. I was out of here. I didn't want to be alive anymore when all this happened. Shame like I had never experienced before. The kind of shame that you forget how to breathe and you don't know where to go. You can't go outside and get like a taco. (laughs) But I was also in this deep desire to hold on. My pain made me willing to seek out the love of Christ. I had nowhere to go other than the arms of God. You notice the two questions that he had to answer? He had to answer, why are you crying? And he answered it, because I'm in hell. My life is hell. I'm experiencing shame like I've never experienced before. And who are you looking for? Well, my pain made me willing to look for Christ. And I found him. And it changed my life. I think we all have to answer those questions. Why are you crying? What is the pain that is driving you in this life? And what are you looking for that will help ease that pain and bring you wholeness? And then the final question is not in the text of this passage, but it's implied. It's the last question that's most important because if you can't answer this question, the first two questions really will still leave you empty. Because you can ask the question, why are you crying? And you can name a number of different things. And you can ask the question, who are you looking for? And you might even know, I'm looking for Jesus. But until you answer this last question, you'll never fully embrace the Jesus of Easter. The last question is this, will you embrace Jesus as your living Lord? Will you embrace Jesus as your living Lord? In our passage, it says, He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, and then she embraced him. He says to her, Mary, he says her name. I love that part of the passage. And here's what I believe today. I believe that God knows your name too. And I believe that God is looking around this room and he's saying, Steve and Abby and Jess and whoever may be in this room, he knows your name. And he is asking the question, will you embrace me as your living Savior? 
You might know why you're crying and why you're upset and why you're struggling. You may know even what you're looking for, but until you're willing to embrace him as your living Lord, you will still have unfinished business with the Lord. You have to embrace him. And, and she says to him, Rabboni, which means master. She recognizes him as her master, as her teacher, and she embraces him. And that's what we have to do, too. That's what the Easter story is all about. It's about a Savior who loved you enough to die on the cross for your sins, who rose again, and who is here to be your master, your friend, your Savior. The question is, will you embrace him today? I want to close with this this morning. My, my Friday started out very difficult. Early Friday morning, uh, I got a phone call from a number that I don't often see on my phone. It was a good friend of mine, one of my closest friends throughout my whole life. It was his wife. She called me about 6.30 in the morning, and I thought, that's odd, uh, I'm not used to hearing from her, and I better answer the phone. So I answered the phone, and she was immediately crying. And she said, Steve, my my husband went to sleep last night. We went to bed together, and he never woke up. He had a heart attack in his sleep, and he's dead. Uh, As my good friend, Tenzie Pricer, he was in my wedding. We were... Very close. He's like a brother to me. Um, So I was devastated and still am devastated. I have to go do his funeral on Wednesday in Baton Rouge. And and it made me think of our whole friendship. Tenzie didn't grow up like I did. I grew up in the church. I grew up with a family who trusted in Jesus. Tenzie didn't grow up that way. He grew up very, very poor. He and his whole family lived in a very run-down apartment in a very difficult, hard part of, of our town. Uh, we, we met whenever I started dating my wife, and he started dating his wife, and our wives were very close friends. And so we met and started to hang out, and we immediately connected and had a brotherhood. I wasn't living for the Lord at the time. He didn't know the Lord at all, and so we spent a lot of time partying. Most of our nights we were at a bar playing pool, and uh, drinking and laughing and carrying on. Um, Some of those nights, we would actually get into some real deep conversation. And when we did, we would talk about the Lord. And I would tell him, I know God is real, and I know Jesus is real, and I trust him, but man, I'm just far from him right now. I'm just wandering away, and and, uh, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing, but I know God is real. And he would listen and really take all of that in. And we just talked about so many different things. One day the Lord kind of delivered me out of that and I surrendered to ministry. And I was in seminary and I hadn't talked to Tenzi in a long time, but my professor gave us an assignment. He said, hey, I want you guys to write a letter telling your testimony and talking about what it means to trust Jesus. And I want you to send that letter to someone who you know doesn't know Jesus and needs to know Jesus. And I thought, I'm not doing that. That's weird. Somebody's just going to get a letter from me out of the blue, and I'm going to hit them over the head with Jesus. Like, it feels forced. I don't, I don't want to do that. But the more I thought about it and the more I prayed about it, the more I kept getting this name in my head. Tenzi, you need to send that letter to Tenzi. And so I wrote a letter. I wrote a three-page letter, handwritten, and I put it in an envelope. I stuck a stamp on it and sent it to Tenzi. And two weeks later, I got a phone call from his wife. And she said, Tenzi read your letter, and he loved it. He cried. He just couldn't quit talking about it and how great it was. and He just couldn't believe you sent him that. You loved him enough to send him that. And he kept it. And today, he walked down the aisle at the end of our church service and gave his heart to Christ. Now look, I've always thought that was a wonderful story, but on Friday morning at 6.30, 
I thought it was the best story I could possibly know. Because my friend who I love, my brother, who I have to bury, I know is with Jesus. Because Jesus is alive. And he knows why you're crying. And he knows what you're looking for. And he is your living Lord. Now the only thing that matters today is will you embrace him? Will you embrace him? Because listen, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. You may go to sleep tonight and not wake up in the morning. Nobody expected that from Tinsley. He's in great, he's in much better shape than me. Guy was fit and disciplined and watched everything he ate, and it still happened. We never know. My point today is don't delay. Don't wait. God knows you. He loves you. He cares about why you're crying. He wants to embrace you, and he wants you to embrace him as your living Lord. So do it today. Y'all bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. I just want to ask, feel compelled to ask, if there's anybody in this room this morning who for the very first time You're willing to say today, you're ready to say today, I want to embrace Jesus as my living Lord. I just came here, I don't know why I came here this morning, the family came or whatever, but I just showed up. But today, after hearing everything that's been said, after experiencing this this morning, I know that Jesus is real and I want to make him, I want to embrace him as my living Lord today. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Nobody else is looking around, but if that's you this morning, will you just raise your hand? Anybody this morning? I have never trusted Jesus, but this morning I'm ready to. Let me pray with you. If that's you today, I just want you to repeat this prayer silently right where you are. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm lost in my sin. I know that I need a Savior. I know why I'm crying. I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for Jesus. And today I'm ready to embrace Him. I want to receive Him as my Savior. And I want to walk with Him forever. So thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you for rescuing me from my darkness. And thank you, God, for loving me. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand with me this morning. <coughs> if you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you, as we sing this last song together, I want to invite you to come forward. You can talk to me. You can talk to Pastor Jess. You can talk to Natalie up here. We're all available for you. So you feel free to come and talk to us. We would love to guide you on what it means to know Jesus and to walk with him. Maybe you're here and you have another prayer need or something else on your heart that you need to talk about. We're here for you too. And then for all of us, there are these candles up here. They just represent God's light in our darkness. And if ever there was a day to celebrate God's light in our darkness, it's today. So maybe you just want to come up and kneel here and light a candle and recognize that God has brought his light into our darkness. That's appropriate too. Feel free to come. Whatever God is leading you to do, you do it. And let's worship him together.